This is Flashpoint History's War of the Worlds. This is Episode 6, Cordoba and Moorish Spain, the Ornament of the World. In the last episode, we discussed the rule of Abd al-Rahman III, who brought al-Andalus into a new golden age of cultural and economic growth. But we left off as the Umayyad Caliphate had been usurped by the cunning al-Mansur. While he elevated the military power of Cordoba to the pinnacle of her existence, he also laid the foundation for her demise. In this episode, we take a closer look at the cultural heritage of Al-Andalus and ask the question, was this really a golden age for humanity, or perhaps just an over-celebrated experiment of multiculturalism? John Julius Norwich was a very impressive person. Politician, diplomat, even appointed commander of the Royal Victorian Order by the Queen of England. In his spare time, he wrote about history, which made him even more impressive. But he left this incredible legacy behind him. He wrote this 1,200-page, mega-behemoth, multi-volume history on the Byzantine Empire, making him a bit of an expert on the subject. And I'll admit, I had cheated and read the abridged short history of Byzantium, which was only a mere 400 pages, but even in that, his intellect and charming narrative style showed through. In one of the early chapters, he described the founding of Constantinople, and he used this style that I really liked. He said that if you had the right people at the right time in the right place, impressive things happen. He was, of course, referring to Constantine the Great, who not only established the basis of the Eastern Roman Empire, but also put Christianity on its course to becoming a world religion. As for timing, Constantine lived in that period of Roman history when the empire was really beginning to fray apart. I mean, Diocletian, his forebearer, was able to hold things together for a bit, but Constantine could read the writing on the wall, so to speak, and acted on his instincts. Hence, he founded a new capital. And then you had the place, the crossroads of east and west on the border between Europe and Asia, a triangular piece of land surrounded by deep water and eventually defended by the legendary walls of Theodosius II, walls that held back invaders for over a thousand years, if you don't include that little incident in 1204. The gift that the Byzantine Empire left for Western civilization was profound. It preserved learning and philosophy, history, science, the wisdom of the past, while the rest of Europe was descending into the Dark Ages. And some can argue that this was a good thing, that this could have been seen as a high point of humanity, but this would have been a relative statement. And I'll tell you right now that this didn't come without its price. The history of Byzantium is about an empire that controlled and subjugated others, when it could. Its armies went forth and fought all the neighbors. It put down Christian heresies with a vigor that was almost unrivaled. I would argue that this comes part and parcel with all the good stuff, like extraordinary public works, preservation of knowledge, and, of course, scary new weapon technologies. And perhaps that's the hallmark of being the big kid on the block, that with being a superpower, you have to be ruthless. That with enlightenment, there's going to be pain, especially for others. This episode was going to be about the cultural achievements of Al-Andalus, which, in my humble opinion, parallel Norwich's philosophy of the right timing people in place. You had this moment in time, which was approximately the 300 years up to the end of the 11th or mid-12th centuries, where you had this mix of people and their cultures that were in close proximity. You had eras of strong government and patronage to the arts, and when you add this to the native and Visigoth and Roman foundations of the peninsula, and then throw in the vast amount of ideas that were coming in from across the Islamic world, which... You know, it stretched geographically to India, but intellectually all the way to China. And then you topped this off with the three major Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. Well, then you have one of the most dynamic melting pots in history, 
However, doing the research for this episode, it became really clear that there's a vast divergence on opinions to what degree of tolerance there actually was. You have people like Chris Lowney, who felt that there was a very reasonable degree of coexistence, who alluded to in his book, A Vanished World, that this could be used as an example for the rest of us. You have Maria Menocal, who emphasized that the cultural exchange that occurred during this time could only have been achieved if there was a high degree of tolerance. And then you have Dario Morera, who strongly felt that the convivencia, the term for peaceful and meaningful coexistence was, you know, was nothing more than an illusion, a myth as he calls it. Morera's take on it is that the Arab dominance of Al-Andalus was problematic at best and destructive and oppressive at worst. It's obviously a complex discussion, and I'd have to venture that the actual truth of convivencia probably lies someplace in between. It was because of this fascinating debate that I had to change my approach to this episode entirely it made me realize I needed to do more research because the cultural legacy of Al-Andalus, which I discovered, transcends Moorish Spain. Its effects can still be felt. Hence, it took me two months instead of the one to make this episode, and I had to get through at least three extra books, and hopefully you folks can credit me a little slack on that. I'm going to stick to the facts as closely as I can, and give you lovely listeners vignettes of prominent people and their association with Al-Andalus. In fact, I'll be giving you these vignettes in the next several episodes because, as I said, the influence of what happened here goes well beyond this time period. And I'm going to leave it up to you to decide whether there was truly convivencia or not. But I want you to keep in mind what the author of The Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald, wrote. In his essay, The Crack-Up, he says, quote, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time. End quote. Now, before you decide whether or not there truly was convivencia or not, put this into the context that this was all actually happening in medieval times, where brutality was the norm. There's a reason we use the term, I'm going to get medieval on you. Keep this all relative to what would happen next. Fundamentalistic and aggressive policies from both Islamic and Christian sides would eventually muscle their way in. The Crusades would start and further to polarize and alienate people's viewpoints. If you do come up to a conclusion, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Email me and I'll post the best ideas I hear online. In 788, Abd al-Rahman I was 57 years old and very near to the end of his life. It had been an interesting life. He grew up as a prince, but fled from the persecution of the Abbasids when they took over the caliphate in 750. He made his way to Al-Andalus, where he overthrew the governor and established a new Umayyad lineage. The Umayyad emirate based in Cordoba that he created and expanded was prosperous. Indeed, it invoked the envy of everyone in the peninsula and then some. Even the great Charlemagne crossed the Pyrenees to take a piece of the action in 778. Rahman's takeover wasn't without its collateral damage. There were plenty that were opposed to his rule, and the Visigoth culture, along with the Christians and the Jews, were to an extent marginalized and suppressed. He and his descendants were renowned for viciously putting down revolt, which there were a lot of them. Despite his successes, he was a man who was consumed. He was consistently longing for his lost home Assyria, for the place of his forebears and his family in Damascus, a place that he knew he could never return to. So instead, he decided to bring his home to Al-Andalus. He bought a Visigoth church known as St. Vincent's in Cordoba and demolished it in order to build a mosque. This was a fairly common thing that was done in the conquered lands of Islam. This mosque would become an heirloom and would be expanded by his line. Eventually, it would be considered a wonder of medieval Spain. The architecture alone was the embodiment of mixed cultures. It was the synthesis of Visigoth horseshoe arches, Roman circular archways, Islamic script, and eventually Byzantine mosaic. But there was something very unusual about this mosque. If you were to enter the mosque today, bring your phone, and not just to take pictures of the incredible architecture, but for the Compass app that comes with it, 
Go to the prayer niche, the mirab, and use it. Note that the direction that it points, the Qibla, is not east towards Mecca, but rather south towards Morocco. This makes absolutely no sense, but to the mind of Rahman, it did. You see, if you were to pick up the whole mosque and transport it to Rahman's home in Damascus and place it there, the direction that the mirab would now point would be towards Mecca. This was a constant reminder of the emir's lost home, but the emir's yearning for his lost birthright was not limited to just architecture. For a modestly brutal conqueror, Rahman had a fondness for botany. The palm trees of his native Syria had especially captured his heart, but he knew that before you have plants, you need to have water. Spain's infrastructure had languished with the fall of the Roman Empire. Vast portions of the peninsula were left unused as irrigation canals and aqueducts and cisterns were either abandoned or had decayed. The Arabs, Syrians, and their Berber allies who were of desert climate had brought with them a multitude of methods of maximizing on water usage. I mean, after all, if you don't have water in the desert, you're going to die. Aqueducts, cisterns, and dams were either built, rebuilt, or expanded. Irrigation canals, known as asakiyas, which come from the Arabic word al sakia meaning to quench, were established. Along the same lines, norias were built. These were massive water wheels that would lift fresh water up so that it could be distributed via these systems, and there were water clocks known as clepsidras that would open and close gates to spread the water evenly. This surplus of water would make the population in Al-Andalus explode and would, in effect, bring about an agricultural revolution. Whereas before, you could only have a select few number of crops that could be grown in the arid environment, now a vast multitude of harvests were introduced. Imagine what the diet in Spain was like before this stuff was added. Citrus plants were brought in from India, which brought in oranges, lemons, limes. To this, the Muslims added figs and peaches and apricots and pears. The land could also support cotton, almonds, eggplant, and sugarcane. And add to this rice, which was also introduced. I mean, imagine Spain without its paella. Now, this wasn't just about improving the diet. Vast gardens would be created throughout Al-Andalus. And going back to Rahman, he even had his cherished palm trees imported. The emir was so entranced that he even wrote poetry about them, displaying his sense of loneliness and isolation. Quote, A palm tree stands in the middle of Rusafa, born in the west, far from the land of palms. I said to it, How like me you are, far away and in exile. In long separation from family and friends, you have sprung from soil in which you are a stranger, and I, like you, am far from home. End quote. Maria Menocal gives us an account of the emir in his final days in her book, The Ornament of the World. Quote, Among the memory palaces built by the exiled Umayyad prince in Al-Andalus, none was more personal and poignant than a place called Rusafa. In Syria, south of the Euphrates, far out on the Syrian steppe, there had been an ancient and mysterious walled city. The Umayyads had turned it into their family retreat, and it was especially beloved by Abd al-Rahman's grandfather, the Caliph Hisham. It was there that the family was found and murdered by the Abbasids. And just outside of Cordoba, Abd al-Rahman built his new Rusafa, a retreat for himself and his new family, and a botanical garden as well. As the years went by, Abd al-Rahman spent more and more time in his garden retreat. He eventually stopped living in Cordoba proper, even as the capital became more luminous. The new Rusafa had become the beloved home of the Andalusian Umayyads. It was here that Abd al-Rahman died in 788. He was surrounded by his beloved palm trees. Nearly 80 years after Rahman I died, lived a man named Paul Alvarez, also known as Alvaro de Cordoba. He was a devout Christian that lived under Islamic rule who was extremely perturbed by what he saw. By 855, the capital had more mosques than churches. The tide of converts to Islam increased by the day, but what worried him was that Arabic was being embraced 
and Latin was being disregarded. Latin, after all, was the language of the Christian scriptures, but Arabic offered the people much more. Maria Menacal brings up a good point, quote, The Christians of Cordoba had found in Arabic, not in Islam, something that clearly satisfied the needs that the language of their own religion, Latin, had failed to meet. Arabic beckoned with its vigorous love of all the things men need to say and write and read that not only lie outside of faith, but may even contradict it, from philosophy to erotic love poetry and a hundred other things in between. End quote. It was in Arabic that people could write poetry, conduct business, and read the imported works that came from across the Islamic world, including the translated works of Plato and Aristotle. It was in Arabic that new ideas could be encountered, and the number of libraries that were expanding were a testament to the wealth of knowledge that was out there. In fact, it was said that by the time of Al-Hakam II, he had a library with 400,000 books. And mind you, this at a time when the average monastery in Europe would be lucky to have 400. I think if you were a teenager at this time, there would have been an incredible amount of peer pressure to pick up the new Terra Lingua. But this came at a price. Adopting a new language and its nuances usually comes at the expense of one's own culture. And this was something that would generate a considerable amount of friction, especially if you had people from different faiths in close proximity that to some extent were being marginalized. Indeed, Alvarez would go on to write a considerable amount of work that was very anti-Muslim in nature. The question arises, was he justified? Dario Morera, in his book, The Myth of the Andalusian Paradise, points out that instituting Arabic as the language of the land was in actuality a means to control the populace, that the cost of embracing Arabic meant embracing Islamic law. As he puts it, quote, Perhaps the most fundamental fact in Al-Andalus is that there was no distinction between civil and religious law. Religion was the law, and therefore Islam was the law. In Islamic Spain, Sharia pervaded every aspect of life, from the private and familiar to the social and public sphere. In this sense, Muslims in Al-Andalus lived under a theocracy. End quote. So the adoption of Arabic was a double-edged sword. It meant compliance with the law of the land. And to be specific, it was the Maliki legal system that was adopted in Al-Andalus, and this emphasized a strict orthodoxy. So while there was religious freedom and tolerance, it had to work under this construct, and thus it wasn't really 100%. And the penalties, by the way, for breaking the law were harsh. Morera again, quote, the Umayyads imposed brutal punishments on the Dhimis. A Dhimmi, by the way, is a protected person of the book, usually implying a Christian or a Jew, who dared to openly proclaim their religious beliefs. In the 9th century, Alim ibn al-Qazim asserted that if a Christian said, our religion is better than yours, he must be punished. Al-Qazim cited Imam Malik's view that when an infidel insulted the Prophet, he must be killed. End quote. Alvarez lived during a time when the friction of living under Islamic rule came to a clash. His friend and fellow devout Christian, Eulogius, would proclaim the faith against the establishment's rules. Their words gained traction, and approximately 50 people came forward to also publicly decry Islam, and as a result, they were executed. Now, it wasn't just the persecutions that scared Alvarez. It was also the fact that Christianity was becoming a minority, and to a decent extent it was from the Christians who were converting to Islam. Many historians argue that the reason for this high degree of conversion to Islam was the jizya, which was a tax on non-Muslims. And it works something like this. If you convert, you lower your tax bracket. If you don't, and you want to practice your religion, well, you pay the tax and you can practice it as a dhimmi, again, a protected person of the book. Some historians would point out that this was a win-win scenario. Morera, on the other hand, has a different viewpoint. Quote, The Christian dimmies of Spain were by definition a subaltern group, a fourth or fifth class marginalized people in a hierarchical society that were the victims of an extortion system, the dimma, that gave them the choice that gangsters give to their victims, pay to be protected, 
or else. End quote. Thus, while Jews and Christians were allowed to keep and practice their own faith, they did so within the framework of a fairly rigid system that allowed them to observe their religion only in private, in isolation, where the call to prayer could be heard from the muzin, but Christian church bells were left quiet. Even the display of religious icons such as crosses were banned either on a person or on a building. This was a system where Sharia law would pervade in times of dispute. <laughs>